Okay, so we we'll begin with the topic arrhythmias. Uh, this will be a detailed topic that we'll try to cover as much as we can in the shortest amount of time possible, and make it as convenient as possible. So bear with me. Uh, when we talk about tachyarrhythmias, we talk about two kinds. Uh, that's the first question that you need to ask yourself whenever you see a tachycardic rhythm. The first one is whether the rhythm is a supraventricular rhythm or a ventricular rhythm. So that's the first question that one asks when they look at the ECG of such a of a tachycardic patient. So, uh, in a supraventricular origin, the QRS complex will always be narrow. So, whenever you have got a narrow QRS complex with tachycardia. There is only one possibility that is a supraventricular taking cardiac. There is no other possibility, right? Uh, but the other pos other thing that we would come to the broad QRS complexes. So when you have a tachycardic rhythm with broad QRS complexes, it could indicate a ventricular rhythm, or it could also indicate less commonly a supraventricular rhythm. Now, how does that happen is basically because of aberrancy. And we discussed in our B60 session about how aberrancy can cause a, a broad QRS complex, right? Because that is um, through an accessory pathway that leads to an earlier depolarization of the ventricle. So this is something that you need to bear in mind. Always look at the width of the QRS complex when in tachycardia. If the QRS complex is narrow, supraventricular, if it is not, then ventricular or supraventricular. Now, supraventricular, we talk about two groups, atrial rhythms and motor rhythms. So atrial rhythms, we have sinus tachycardia, we have premature beats, we have atrial factor fibrillation and tachycardia. The latter three are the principal ones that we you would most likely encounter both in terms of identification and management. And then we have got nodal tachycardias. The two most common ones are the AVRT and the AVNRT. They are different pathologies, often confused by students. They're not the same. And we'll be discussing each of them later. The junctional tachycardia, finally, not something high yield, and we'll not be going into detail of that. So it's just a mention over here. Now, what we need to understand is that supraventricular origin can never result in a broad QRS complex unless they're an associated evidence. So we have already talked about that, right? The next thing, all unstable tachyarrhythmias that are with a pulse, you would always treat them with DC cardioversion. This is the important point. So something that you just memorize and you will be good to go with a lot of management. So whenever you have a patient with presenting with tachyarrhythmia, some form of tachyarrhythmia, and they're unstable, their BP is severely low, they are either have chest pain, they're having other signs of hemodynamic instability, then they will be classified as unstable and treated as such, but they need to have a pulse. Without the pulse, the management is different. Without the pulse, the ACNS protocol is triggered. The CPR is initiated, and then you have got an identification of what kind of rhythm it could be. Uh, there comes more rhythms into play, such as ventricular fibrillation, ACSA, and all that. So those rhythms come into play. So uh, this is with a pulse. It's always with a pulse. Finally, tachyarrhythmias with an irregular rhythm, uh, we have talked about this previously as well. Whenever you have a tachyarrhythmia that has an irregular rhythm, we consider four differentials, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter with variable block, mat, which is multifocal atrial tachycardia, and finally ectopic beats. The first one, pretty basic, uh, sinus tachycardia, you will always have a normal B wave that is followed by a normal QRS complex with increased heart rate. So it is just like a sinus rhythm. We talked about identification of a sinus rhythm previously, you just increase the heart rate. And if everything else stays the same, it is blocked by the sinus tachycardia. It is always regular. It can never be regular, obviously. Uh, the etiology could be fever. It could be hypovolemia. It could be anemia. Those are the classic causes. Hyperthyroidism can do is There's a number of causes for sinus tachycardia. Infections can cause it. Uh, so you always just manage the underlying condition. Sinus tachycardia is not itself a big pathology. So an CG pattern, when they would give it to you, they would most likely give it to you a proper arrhythmia rather than a sinus tachycardia. But the basic identification remains the same. You need to identify Fire. Uh, this is the example of it. We, what you're looking right here is a regular rhythm. It is tachycardia, rate around slightly lesser than 150. The P waves are there with before each QRS complexes. So this is a sinus tachycardia, right? Let's we'll zoom in on that, and then finally we have got. The next row, uh, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, the AVNRT. Now I've jumped from an atrial rhythm to an oral rhythm for a reason, and I'll discuss that now because it is very similar to sinus tachycardia. So when you see that rhythm, you will see those narrow QRS complexes, you will see that fast heart rate. But sometimes in that mix of things, you should you often forget to look at the P wave. If there is no P wave, it is not sinus tachycardia. So there are no normal P waves in it. So you can have P waves that are either buried inside the QRS complex, they will be not visible at all, or you can have them right after the QRS complex. So you will see a small, um, 
small spike just before the T wave, and that is the abnormal P wave that is happening because of the fact that it is uh, the nodal rhythm. So when you have a nodal rhythm, it will be depolarizing the ventricle and then the atrium in the retrograde direction. So when that kind of thing happens, uh, you can have a P wave that occurs after the QRS complex because P wave represents your atrial depolarization. Or it can occur at the same time with the P wave being buried. Simple as that. So most cases are very simple to identify, but if you have got a very high heart rate, then you just compare the PR and the RP intervals. For example, the uh, normally your PR interval should be lesser than your RP interval, but if the uh, RP interval is in fact smaller, then that would be supraventricular tachycardia because the P wave could occur slightly after the QRS complex, just like I talked about here. So in, in an AB and RT, the RP interval would be shorter in fact. Now, this is an episodic in nature. So, uh, I have discussed this previously with you guys as well, that always look at the ECG first and then the question stem. This will strengthen your ECG reading skills. It will you know, make you confident about your ECG analysis and it will solve your questions. So, you need to understand it. What, look at the ECG first. But whenever you are looking at tech arrhythmias, for example, the clinical presentation would all, almost always be palpitations, raised heartbeat or anything like that or something, even asymptomatic. So, the classic feature that they would give you in a clinical presentation of this question is a paroxysmal nature. They will give you episodes of that and that those episodes will either resolve on, the, on their own or through a vehicle maneuver. So, the first line treatment of this, this is something that they ask. It is always a carotid massage. You will always do that first, not necessarily applicable in a clinical setting always, but this is something th theoretically as uh, the first line. Second line is adenosine. We have a proper protocol before giving adenosine. Uh, it can give you that sense of impending doom. Never ever choose this as the right answer when bronchospasm is there in the clinical presentation in the form of asthma or anything like that. It can reverse in that bronchospasm. So this is a careful consideration before marking adenosine. This is something I like to talk about all the drugs. Whenever you're looking at a drug and you're marking it, uh, there are a few drugs that are very classic contraindications. So even if you do not remember all the, all the adverse effects of that drug, you just remember the classic contraindication. And before marking that drug, regardless of the scenario, before marking that drug, always try to find that contraindication within the system. Just see if it is there. Because, for example, asthma is there, adenosine, asthma is also there in beta blockers. So if you have to mark beta blockers for any any point at all, for example, even for hydroxychloroquine, just for once look at the question stem. Look at whether there is a specific contraindication to that. So this is something uh, that is relatively easier to do rather than trying to remember all the adverse effects of a drug and trying to see whether I can give that drug or not. So this is something that you should remember. The next thing, uh, the next you can give is calcium channel blockers. They can be non diet They have to be non diet in, in nature because those are the ones that act on the heart. So you have virapamilin tilidiasm. So those drugs uh, are the next line after these two treatments. The rhythm that you see here is what we call as the classic paroxysm of supraventricular tachycardia or the AVNRT. Uh, not necessarily synonymous, actually, but AVNRT is the most common type of proxy not supraventricular tachycardia. So you see there are no P waves. You saw the previous rhythm, right? The P waves were there. Here, there are no P waves. This is classic for that. The rhythm is still regular. It's not irregular, so it is always like that. Uh, narrow QRS complexes, classic AVNRT. Next thing, ectopic beats. Ectopic beats are something that are outside your normal electrical system, right? They have to be outside the system. It can be atrial, they can be junctional, they can be ventricular. And then they can be either um, an escape beat that is uh, occurring after a rhythm. They can be a premature beat. It depends on their timing. But the classic thing to know, to know is that you need to identify it first, right? You need to identify whether the beat is a topic itself or not. When you talk about atrial beats, uh, the, the origin in the atrial myocardium is outside the normal rhythm, obviously. So should normal be waves be present in that? No, you cannot have a normal TV if it is not happening uh, from the normal sinus node, the no normal TV will not be there. So it is either an abnormal morphology or it is absent. The next thing is that you need to know, know about the full compensatory pause. Now, this is a mechanism. This is a simple trick to identify what type of ectopic you do have. Mostly in the question stems, you will be given ectopic beats in the form of scenarios the way they would like you to know the management and the investigation that would be associated with it that we would come to later. But identification is sometimes a question as well. 
So, and generally, as well, you should know how to identify an atrial bleed from a premature bleed. So, what is a compensatory cause? Now, this one that you see here, this arrow, this bleed is a premature bleed, right? Because it is occurring prior to what is expected of this. If you look at the full strip, there's a small strip, but there will be regular intervals between the RR complexes before that, and then suddenly this will happen. So, this is a premature bleed. Um, now, what to do with that? You should always identify the R QRS complex before that. This is the QRS complex before that. Go behind that as well and see what is the RR interval. For example, here I've calculated for you the RR interval is 3.2 large boxes. So there are three small boxes here, then five, three small boxes, then one large box, two large box, and then uh, four small boxes again. So we have got like uh, three large boxes in total and it's two small boxes. So when you apply this RR, when you know what the RR interval is, what you do is you just pre preceding uh, the premature beat, whatever R complex is there, you pre you extrapolate uh, double the RR interval from the previous one. You just extrapolate that. Right? You will go to RR. For example, if we had 3.2, I will what I'll do now is I'll go 6.4 boxes ahead of this one. And I'll go there and reach here. This point that I reach, is the normal compensatory cause. Normally, after a premature beat, this should the next beat should be over here rather than over here because obviously, when you talk about three QRS complexes, the interval between those three should be two times the RR rather than lesser than that. But in an atrial beat, what happens, or even in a junctional beat, what happens, the compensatory cause is not full. It is a non compensatory cause. This beat is occurring before that regular expected dotted line that you see. So this is how you identify it. Always mark this RR interval, have this habit of marking this whenever you see an ectopic beat, a premature beat, and then identify whether it's the atrial or ventricular beat. Because what is the common confusion here that we have talked about those basic HTG uh, tips that a narrow QRS complex means a supraventricular thing and a broad one means a, 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 a ventricular thing or a SP, supraventricular thing with evidence, but in an atrial premature beat, the QRS complex is not necessarily narrow. You see a narrow one here, but it can be broad in some cases. Now, how does that happen? Sometimes it just happens that your P wave, which is of abnormal morphology, just merges with that QRS complex and it gives that impression that the QRS complex is prolonged. So it may look like a broad QRS complex. So it is not the best identifying marker for differentiating between an atrial and a particular premature beat. So the best identification marker is this one. You just identify it through this. It's a simple mechanism. You should learn that and you should always apply that when you receive a premature beat. Right? I've written it that QRS can, can be narrow or it can be broad. That's the number one thing. Number two, we have junctional beats. If you look at uh, the, the picture here that you see is not of a junctional beat, it is of a ventricular beat. Junctional beat, I could not find uh, an image that could produce. Uh, but junctional beats, uh, premature beats, usually the QRS will not be broad. Again, the compensatory pause is not there. So it is just like the age will be in that sense. And P wave would either be retrograde or the P body. If you see a retrograde P wave, it is most likely a junctional premature beat, not an atrial pre premature beat. But if it is buried, it gets kind of hard to tell between a junction and an atrial one. But the retrograde P wave would always almost indicate junction because you're having uh, the atrial depolarization in the opposite direction. It's happening from the AV node, it's happening from the junction. So when that happens, it's in the opposite fashion. You can have a retrograde P wave. Uh, QRS complex narrow, the non competitive posture, right? So that is the thing. Ventricular one, look at this ventricular rhythm. First of all, classic broad premature ventricular contraction. Uh, once you get used to seeing these, you would almost always just see this and think of BBC initially very soon. So broad QRS complexes that are, there are no B waves, obviously there are this ventricular beat and it's a full compensatory cost. So again, we look at, uh, am I audible to everybody? Am I audible to everybody? Okay, perfect. There's some error just happened. Okay, never mind. So uh, we talked about this premature ventricular contraction. We talked about a beat preceding that. Uh, this was the normal QRS complex. And we applied that too. So we scaled it to RR and it will fall nearly the marker is slightly wrong if you calculated it yourself. Uh, you, will, you can do that from the PDF that will be available after this presentation. You will see this calculation, it will fall right on. So this is the normal full compensatory was. In the PVC, the compensatory was will be full. This is the this is the first thing you do when you see a 
a premature wheat right now that's identification they could ask you about it what is triggering it it is usually idiopathic but it, it is the triggers of it like the cause of it is usually idiopathic but the triggers of it could be smoking it could be caffeine it could be alcohol they would be classic triggers that you would be provided in a question of champion you are provided with ectopic piece in the ecg and uh, the complication they can evolve into tachycardia especially with pvcs uh, a ventricular tachycardia which we'll come to discuss later simply three pvcs or more in succession so uh, that is about the significance of them clinically but management when you see isolated pvcs or pacs or junction beats that are not recurrent that are not symptomatic for the individual you just go for the reassurance and avoidance of triggers a very common question that they ask you they would give you the ecg they would ask you what to do just reassure them. those two will never be in the same option system like they will not give you both of them like reassurance and avoidance of triggers in the same question system they'll either give you the answer of reassurance or they will give you the option of avoidance of triggers so you just have to mark one because both are appropriately right if it is very symptomatic and it, it is recurring then you consider two things and those two things i like to remember it with the e's ectopic beats then echocardiography and electrolytes so all three of them are the e trilogy you can call it so that is something that you can consider and that is a diagnostic test that i have not seen in a patient's time myself but if they give you that symptomatic or recurrent pvc and tell you that they has they've had uh, prior ecgs with the uh, recurring pvcs what to do next you should go for echocardiography and electrolytes next thing atrial fibrillation it is always an irregular rhythm so, right atrial fibrillation will be irregular that is the first thing to know there will be narrow qrs complexes and less the rhythm is be excited so be very sure about that that uh, don't always see a broad qrs complex and too loud atrial fibrillation irregular rhythm and then absence of fibrillating beep if you see those three classic features you see those features you mark atrial fibrillation almost blindly because that is so certain of it uh then the risk factors they would ask you about it mostly in step 1 not as much in step 2 but age is the most important risk factor and you're going to have hypertension you're going to have hypo hypothyroidism and all those things that you can find in the clinical scenario as well once you have stepped out of the ecg and come to the question stem itself you're going to have triggers like for it like alcohol stressors like surgery infection all of those those are potential triggers finally the types there are three types we have paroxysmal persistent or permanent and what to do in this management right now management if it is a the first thing that you need to know when an atrial fibrillation you need to see the ventricular rate it is not always a tachycardia sometimes it is the normal ventricular rate and sometimes it is the tachycardia so if it is the tachycardia form the risk we call it as the rbr rapid ventricular response and the patient is stable why stable because we talked about unstable before right all unstable tachycardia are to be treated with ec cardioid simple as that so if they are stable we initiate rate control that is the best therapy for uh, atrial fibrillation but always always be cautious when you're selecting this rate control the rhythm cannot be pre-excited if it is pre-excited you are ruining the tachyarrhythmia you are worsening it uh, you'll cause a catastrophe because you will block the AV node with these rate control agents and the accessory pathway will just get over triggered right so beta blockers are the first line in a normal uh, atrial fibrillation to, for rate control they are the first line always the first line unless there's a content negation you, you can go for calcium channel blockers digoxin is another option limited use these days but in heart failure with concomitant heart failure for example atrial fibrillation with uh, tachycardia and myopathy you can go for digoxin now you achieve that you do that for acute management then you see whether the rhythm is resolving for example the rhythm has not resolved on your rate control therapy you need to dc cardio with the patient as well even if the patient was stable in the presentation there is no sign this, the criteria of hemodynamic instability is not there for this patient but we are treating the patient because the arrhythmia is not resolving and atrial fibrillation is dangerous now if it is less than 48 hours we do not need to anticoagulate with the patient how will we know that whether the patient has got atrial fibrillation for 48 hours or more we can only know that if we have a prior ecg if we do not we assume that the time spent is more than 48 hours it's as simple as that uh, the next thing uh, no need to, for example, if it is more than 48 hours, there are two things that you need to do. You need to anticoagulate the patient for three weeks before the ECC version, or you need to rule out the thrombus by a transient feature. Like, for example, in urgent scenarios, the best mechanism is just do a DE 
go for rule out the thrombus, go for DCA cardioversion because the DCA cardioversion can dislodge the thrombus. It can cause an embolic stroke. It can cause an embolic infarction anywhere else in the body. So this is why, why the importance of anticoagulation in DCA cardioversion. Finally, in chronic therapy, patients who have got persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation, you need to rate control them. You need to have uh, that uh, rate preferably under less than 110 if the patient is asymptomatic or if the patient is symptomatic, less than 80. And finally, rhythm control is another alternative to it, uh, less preferred mode of therapy, but can be considered if rate control fails or if there's underlying heart failure. Uh, the chemical agents that we go for rhythm control, basically DC cardioversion is also a form of uh, rhythm control, but we are talking about pharmacological uh, cardioversion or deep rhythm control. So those drug classes that are used in that are 1A, 1C, and 3. We can look at those antiarrhythmics. There are different ones that are used for different uh, scenarios. Uh, not necessarily high yield for you to remember. Uh, we'll talk about the specific indications of any of them if they come up. Atrial fibrillation, this is the classic ECG that you're seeing right here. Uh, you are seeing that irregular pattern. You are seeing a no proper B waves. There's a baseline. Those waves that you are seeing here and probably here or here, these are D waves. They're not B waves. So make sure that you do not confuse the two. The baseline is fibrillating. It is a classic atrial fibrillation pattern, possibly with a rapid ventricular response rate. If you look at the 10 second ship and if you see the number of your assessed complex, they will definitely go over 100. Uh, now, uh, anticoagulation is another part of bias. So we talked about rate control, we talked about rhythm control, we talked about DCA cardioversion, we talked about anticoagulation. Now, when to anticoagulate those patients? Uh, for persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation patients, they're always at the risk of forming a clot. So in those cases, when you have valvular atrial fibrillation, you always consider anticoagulation. That is the first thing you need to do. Whether the, your atrial fibrillation that you're dealing with is a valvular form or a non-valvular form. Valvular form means there's mitral stenosis associated with it. Now, the drug of choice is Duox, which is the direct oral anticoagulants. But warfarin can be preferred if there is very severe mitral stenosis and con on a mechanical heart valve. Mechanical heart valve has a more proper indication for warfarin uh, as compared to a very severe mitral stenosis. Uh, that is still more of a controversy, but this is a general clinician preference. Uh, then we talk about non valvular forms of uh, the atrial fibrillation. Just calculate the risk of uh, coagulation through the charge mass score. See if you have you need the uh, anticoagulation or not. If it is greater than two, you probably need it, and you go for the two. Those are the preferred ones in the non valvular form side. Complications: embolism, tachycardia, induced cardiomyopathy. The two classic complications you need to be aware of. Pre-excited atrial fibrillation is a classic drug of choice that they ask you about. It is procainamide. Uh, broken amide being, um, I think, a 1A drug, if I'm not wrong. So uh, that is the classic drug of choice, right? Talk about atrial flutter. This is the rhythm that you're seeing below. Uh, it is a flutter or sawtooth type of P-wave. So those P-waves are not exactly fibrillating. They are more like a sawtooth or those jagged shapes that you see right there. It is always regular. This is the classic difference. If you see a regular rhythm and you're seeing those abnormal B waves, it can never be atrial fibrillation. That's the first thing. But if it is irregular, it can be atrial fracture or fibrillation both depending on whether the atrial fracture is associated with clot. Very important, very, very important to know atrial fracture is not always there in every bead. You cannot atrial fibrillation you will find in every bead, but atrial flutter, it is you will see those normal leads if you do not look at every deed. I've seen a question stem where there was a uh, atrial fracture in one deed, I think, or two leads. So you need to look at every lead and you need to look at every lead to identify whether the flutter is there. Typically in the leads that are in PA, U3 and AVF, the management is the same as the atrial fibrillation, saves us from a lot of uh, hectic memorization, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, remember them as the same. Permanent solution is catheter evitation of the tricuspid valve. So that is slightly different from atrial fibrillation. By the way, you, the, uh, the origin of uh, the abnormal electrical activity is from the tri around the tricuspid valve in this scenario. Atrial tachycardia, most important feature, you will have abnormal P waves. That is the first important feature, abnormal P waves, right? Because it is occurring from the atrium, not the sinus wall. Focal atrial tachycardia has a regular rhythm. That is typical of it. Focal means there's just one origin focus. The multifocal one is the one that they will ask you about. I have not seen a question this time on focal. It was just important to touch on it because you need to understand the concept of why we call multifocal and focal. Multifocal is identified with an irregular rhythm with at least three or more different B-wave morphologies. 
in the same lead. I've highlighted both three or more and the same lead coin. It's very important to know you cannot have uh, different morphologies in different ways. If it is the same lead and you have different morphologies of the algorithm, the diagnosis match, a classic diagnosis that you need to be able to identify for your question stems because they ask you about the management that we will come to the underlying causes of treatment. You treat the underlying cause and the it may resolve. Typically, the COPD uh, case they would give it to you because that, that is a classic cause of multiple atrial tachycardia. And rate control can be considered after this, something that they would never ask, but something that you need to be aware of clinically. Uh, what you'll see in this rhythm over here, there are three the, the arrows are making it easier for you. Uh, it is actually an irregular rhythm, the narrow complex, or uh, but the P waves, look at the P waves in the same lead. Have this 0.21 tall one over here, the short one over here, there's this retrograde one over here. So there are three different morphologies. The the focus is just all over the place, right? This is multifocal atrial tachycardia. And uh, if you did not have a tachycardia with this sort of phenomenon, then that is something we call as the wandering pacemaker. The pacemaker just keeps moving around the heart. But that's not something that they would ask. Now we have AVRT, different from AV and RT. Always remember that the two terms are not synonymous. It is an accessory pathway that forms the re circuit with this AV node. So some form of accessory pathway between the atria and the ventricle. That is why we have the term atrial ventricular. And there are two forms. We have orthograde forms and the integrate forms. Now we'll come back to that original concept that we had, that we have can have a broad QRS complex, the supraventricular rhythm. Uh, how will that happen? That will happen in this form, integrate uh, direction of depolarization. What happened is the atria when depolarize the ventricles to the accessory pathway, not the normal pathway. And when the accessory pathway is used, it is a slow conduction pathway. So the ventricles will depolarize so slowly and the QRS will be brought. Simple as that. But in the orthograde pathway, what happens is that the uh, depolarization happens through the normal pathway. And then the re entrant circuit, the repolarization will happen back towards through the accessory pathway. So your QRS complex is going to stay normal. Orthograde is still more normal. So that is why we say when we see a broad complex tachycardia, it is almost always ventricular, except for a very few cases. Uh, orthograde, uh, so that is between orthograde and antigrade. And WP2 terminal syndrome is the classic syndrome that you need to be uh, aware of when it comes to the accessory pathway and delta waves. Now you see these delta waves primarily when you have do not have a tachycardia in tachycardia you can also see that hard to identify but primarily we do not have tachycardia associated with that uh, accessory pathway because not always you have the accessory pathway when the rhythm is tachycardic it can only go apparent or tachycardic in certain scenario uh, but this is it so delta wave you see this in an ECD the diagnosis is classically directly uh, an accessory pathway syndrome, most likely W media blue syndrome and treatment for this we just update the catheter uh, the accessory pathway so this is up until now, right? The supraventricular ones are finished. I am. Uh, uh, they might look a lot to remember, but once you remember those subtle points about everything, then it's easy. Now, ventricular tachycardia is much more easier, much more prettier as well when it comes to identification. Ventricular tachycardia, this is the classic form. Uh, there will be three P, three or more PVCs, right? That is the basic definition. We classify it into two forms, either sustained or unsustained. Something that you can know theoretically, something that does not ask. It can be monomorphic or polymorphic in terms of morphology. I'll come to what does that mean. We'll have broad QRS complexes, obviously, because it is a ventricular rhythm and the risk factors are ischemic heart disease instruction and all. Very, very, very dangerous rhythm in terms of its impact. It will cause certain cardiac death. That is the most problems, biggest problem associated with now. And then acute ventricular tachycardia, you see whether the patient it is unstable or stable. If the patient is unstable, hemodynamically unstable, and the pulse is not there, you begin the ACLS protocol, basically, you do the CPR and everything, and eventually you will need to defibrillate the patient if it is VT without pulse. But if it is unstable with pulse, you go for the DC cardio version. You go for DC cardio version, there is a point that you are, uh, I have written here, defibrillation is polymorphic. This is a very important point. Sometimes they will give you a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and they will give you the pulse. But the answer is not DC cardio it is defibrillation. So in uh, essentiality, you have uh, three rhythms that are treated with defibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation, DC, uh, ventricular tachycardia without a pulse, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, even with a pulse or without a pulse does not matter. So that, those are defibrillation criteria. Now, if it is stable, I mean, you don't have the drug of choice. That is a drug of choice for ventricular arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia, very good for 
uh, multiple forms of ventricular tachycardia, but we can have other drugs as well. You can look uh, those up, but this is the first line. Long term treatment with a ventricular tachycardia, you you can, you should ideally go for an ICD placement. There are four indications for that. Those four indications should always stay with you. Number one is channelopathy. Number one is a number two is a prior certain cardiac arrest, a prior episode of that. Number three is a sustained ventricular tachycardia, or number four is the heart failure with ejection fraction of less than 25 percent. Right now. Beta blockers. If you have got the only, they are the only known drug that improves survival in patients with ventricular arrhythmia. This is the classic point about them. So you always go for beta blocker treatment in these patients on long term. That's the first line. Uh, another thing to know about, uh, for example, I told you about SCD. So in channelopathy, you can think of beta blockers as well. That those are the first line that you get. Channelopathy is the first line indication uh, is a beta blocker. So again, they are because of the their survival benefit on the certain cardiac death scenario. So this is an important slide. Next, we come to the rhythm. You see this rhythm, this broad QRX complexes, these broad QRX complexes in that tachycardia. This is a classic ventricular tachycardia, monomorphic. The, the picture that you're seeing is monomorphic. I talked about those two forms. The forms of each QRS complex is identical. This is why we call it the monomorphic QRS, uh, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. The next one is torsage points. Uh, this is a, a form of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Always remember that not all types of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia are torsades. Not all forms. This is a common confusion. You can have a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that is not torsades. And I would suggest you to look it up on Google. I'm not including an image here. Uh, so on Google, you can see those polymorphic forms. The, the, they will not be twisting around the central axis like a torsage does. Those, those classic sinusoidal form will not be there. So this is the important feature. And why is it important? Because you do not give magnesium in that scenario. In the other form of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, but in torsage, we do that. So it is a type of polymorphic VT. The sinusoidal form is there. The risk factor. Most important, there's only one risk factor you need to know, QT prolongation, and obviously there are multiple etiologies associated with it. You can have electrolytes. We talked about those two, three electrolyte abnormalities earlier as well, the three hypos, the hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, the drugs, antipsychotics, TCAs, and macrolides, other drugs as well, one genital long PT syndrome. Those are uh, the classic causes of this. So if the patient is unstable, for defibrillation we talked about how polymorphic ventricular tachycardia needs to be treated with defibrillation when unstable and the patient is stable IV magnesium first line so magnesium is the something that they commonly test you about uh in torsal do not necessarily look at the magnesium levels when you're treating this uh arrhythmia for example if the patient has got hypermagnesemia and then they have torsars then you might think obviously the magnesium is low so we go for magnesium but even if the patient does not have hypermagnesemia and the torsars is because of something else you still go for magnesium because the drug works for that it's not that you are replacing the magnesium you're giving it because of the fact that it works so effectively for torsars Finally, ventricular fibrillation, no baseline proper QRS complex. It's the end stage rhythm. We talk about the near death rhythm and you need to the ACLS water pulse straight away because the patient will be pulseless. You will give CPR and eventually if the rhythm is identified as a ventricular fibrillation, you will defibrillate it. Now you look at this very importantly. Some students do confuse it as a, a ventricular tachycardia. It is not the same because you see those QRS complexes, they are not properly formed. If you look at those monomorphic ventricular tachycardia ones, they are much more properly formed. So this is uh, slightly different than that. Even more so than that, first rhythm, so they will be very, very small fibrillating waves, just like an atrial fibrillation. So uh, this is this can get tricky to identify, but keep looking at um, a few images and you will be able to pick them up with uh, differentiate from BD. Now, approach to tachycardia is very important. Very, very important. Uh, uh, can you show the ventricular tachycardia? Okay. I'll just show the ventricular tachycardia at the end of the session. Okay. I'll just show it again to show the difference. Now, approach. In an emergency, you obviously apply the ABCD protocol. Lack of pearls will initiate the LS. The next thing, when the rhythm is identified, identify whether it's a shockable or non shockable. This is part of the ACLS protocol. It's not our class, though, but something that, that is the basic of it. So, uh, the next thing, shockable rhythms. You have two talk shockable rhythms, VFIP or VTAC. Those are the ones that we discussed in our arrhythmia, right? Not the non shockable ones like the PEA, which is the pulse, the electrical activity, and the ACS. VFIP or VTAC without pulse, we talked about defibrillation. 
and all other tachy arrhythmias. We talked about DC card in cardioversion when they are hemodynamically unstable. Only when they're you know, hemodynamically unstable, not other ways, right? Now, stable patient. Look at the QRS complexes and regularity. We talked about this point very early on in the class. We initiated our discussion with that. The first thing we look at in a rhythm, when it's a techie rhythm, we look at the QRS complexes and we see the regularity. The QRS complex is a narrow and regular. Now, one thing to know, when you look at the ECG in the QRS complex is narrow and regular, you can either identify that rhythm, you can get to the core of that rhythm, what that rhythm is. We discussed all those rhythms earlier. Or you, if you cannot identify it, if it's an undifferentiated rhythm, then just treat as a PSP. This is the classic protocol. Treat every narrow QRS complex that is regular tachycardia with the PSVD protocol. The protocol states gyrotrit massage, adenosine, beta blockers, calcium some blockers, those. Narrow QRS complex and irregular, if the rhythm is identified, treat accordingly. If undifferentiated, again, you treat it like PSV. Even if the rhythm is going irregular, but you cannot identify the rhythm, uh, not something that they would give you, because when they would give you an e when they would give you an ECG, they would give you the identification markers to get to it right down to the rhythm. But this is for undifferentiated rhythm. So you treat it like PSVT. Now, wide QRS complexes, I talked to you about how they can be both supraventricular and ventricular. And you differentiate it on something called the Pogada criteria, something that is not part of our lecture. You can look it up if, you, if you're interested. And uh, undifferentiated one is treated as ventricular tachycardia. Simple as that. Obviously, we are dealing with a more common methodology or etiology, but also more lethal ones. You treat it like VT. Although it could be an SPT with evidence, but you treat it like VT if it is undifferentiated. Next one, bradyarrhythmia. So good thing for us all is that take arrhythmias are done. Those were the most uh, abundant ones. Very are pretty much easy. So they will wrap up in a few. Unstable bradycardia. First thing that you need to remember is that unstable take arrhythmias and unstable bradycardia management. We talked about DC cardioversion there and defibrillation when needed. We talk about unstable bradycardia having atropine as a first line management. First line management, always atropine. Second line, if atropine fails, some sources say repeat dose of atropine, some sources say just do for transcutaneous or transvenous pacing. Stable rhythm. Stable rhythm, you have to identify it, whether it's an atrial bradyarrhythmia or it's a nodal bradyarrhythmia. So atrial origin, you have sinus bradycardia, sinus arrests, pauses, sick sinus syndrome. All of them have not included separate ECs of that. They're pretty easy to identify sinus bradycardia. It's just that sinus rhythm with a slow heart rate in a sinus arrest. You have got uh, normal beats and then there's a sudden arrest of sinus activity and then uh, an escape beat happens. Uh, in pauses, there is a small gap and then there is the normal sinus rhythm again. And finally, in sinus syndrome, you can have multiple etiologies of that. You can have alternating bradycardia and tachycardia. You can have arrests and pauses and everything. And you'll have that whole etiology. And finally, I've got nodal origin having the AV nodal blocks. Next, AV nodal blocks, the most important ones for us. First step, you assess if the RR intervals are regular or irregular. Whenever you're considering a block, whenever you have bradycardia, always look at the RR intervals. See if they are regular and irregular, and if all your next steps would be easy, you will be very quickly down to the right block. If the rhythm is irregular, sorry, regular, there can be only two differentials. Either it is a first degree or it is a third degree, or there's a bracket written that is very important. A two is to one block is always regular as well. Now I'll talk about what two one block is, but that is also regular. So not always that you see a regular rhythm, you can just rule out a second degree completely, but pretty much always it's a first and third degree, right? First degree. Now, why we differentiated on this basis? Because the first degree is so markedly different than the third degree. That if you have identified the regular rhythm and if you have identified that, uh, the next step becomes easy. So all you need to do is differentiate between first and third degree and then it, it is very easy because the differences are very significant. First degree, you do, have, do not, you do not have drop beats. You have prolonged PR interval, which is greater than 0.2 seconds. But in a third degree, uh, there is no relationship between the P wave and the Q. Now, the RR intervals will stay regular, but the P waves will not be related to those QRS complexes. And they will be happening all over the place. You can have multiple ratios of that. This is called as AV dissociation. But in that, too, the P waves will have that regularity. For example, every P wave will be equally distant with the other P wave. The P, the intervals with, uh, the PP intervals will be constant. And the RR intervals will be separately constant. Because the atria are operating independently and the ventricles are operating independently. That is why it is the AV dissociation. So when you look at a third degree rhythm, look at the RR interval 
That is the first step in any block, right? It is regular, but always also look at the PP interval. See if it is regular or not. And if it is regular, you're almost always looking at a third degree block, right? In a first degree, no drop base, just a prolongation. Uh, and the prolongation is fixed. It's not that it is changing over time. If it is, it is always fixed. For example, it is 0.4 second in one, it will be 0.4 second in the next complex, in the next complex, in the next complex, and so on. First degrees are treated with the reassurance, while a third degree one is treated with the pacemaker. This is the difference. Uh, this is other tip that we would come to at the end, how to remember the management of it. Uh, but let's first discuss the second degree. If it, the rhythm is regular, irregular, it is always a second degree. Uh, an irregular rhythm only means a second degree. It cannot be first degree, it cannot be first degree. Now, type 1. It is divided into two types, type 1 and type 2. It is Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2. Mobitz type 1 is called the banky bank phenomena, where you have progressive PR prolongation. You have progressive PRs that are prolonging over each beat, and then all of a sudden, when the distance goes enough uh, long, we have a drop beat. And the treatment is reassurance. We treat it, treat this block with reassurance, and we treat the first degree with reassurance for one reason and one reason only. The reason is that those blocks are high up in the AV node. They're not below the AV node. And that is a typical thing, obviously. Uh, not always the case, but typically high up in the node. And when typically high up in the node, they do not know always arrest in a complete block. A complete block means that the if the block is below the AV node, it can go into the bundle branch and cause a complete block. But that does not happen with these blocks. So that is why we generally go for reassurance, not a pacemaker. But uh, Mobitz type 2 block can actually advance because it is below the AV node. And third degree is obviously chaotic. You need to give the pacemaker. So uh, in a Mobitz type 2, you have fixed for long interval, but the uh, drop beats are there. That's what the, is making the rhythm irregular, right? The, the second degree AV block is irregular because there are drop beats. So obviously the RR intervals cannot be constant. That is what's making it irregular. Uh, but the interval is fixed. It is prolonged and it is fixed at a prolonged uh, stage. This is the different from that first degree because prolonged PR interval is not associated with drop beats. So I simply talk, told you about looking at the regularity and assessing whether it's second degree or not. This is the same thing that I've told you about. The lower the block, the higher the risk of complete heart block. Uh, next thing. Now this is identification element. I'll, I would like you to identify each of these blocks based on the point that we've discussed. Uh, I would appreciate all kinds of responses. So please be slightly more responsive. Look at this, assess whether it is a regular one or an irregular one, then let me know. Uh, and then tell me what type of block it is. Any answers? Any answers, anybody? So you're seeing this as a regular rhythm. It's very easy to identify that the RR intervals are regular, so it cannot be second degree. That is the first thing to do now. Simple, now you're left with being between first and third degree. So these P waves that you are seeing, there's a P wave here, there's a P wave here, then there's a P wave here, then there's a P wave merging with the T wave, then there's a P wave here. These P waves do not have a relationship with the QRS complex. So this is not a first degree block. In a first degree block, you would see P wave between a QR before an empty QRS complex at a prolonged interval. So this is a third degree block. And uh, the, if you look at the PP interval, this and this, this and this, this and this further, and this and this, this is all we consider. So this is a third degree block. What is this one? The second one that is on top of it. What is this one? Guys, please, any responses would be appreciated. Okay, this is the first type of block. It says it's regular, the PR interval is prolonged, there are no two drop beats. What is this one? This is actually slightly tricky. So be careful of what you reply. 
any ideas okay so i'll just break it down for you this is a, a regular rr intervals so remember i told you that it can either be first degree or can be third degree but there's a third type of thing that you need to consider why do we need to consider that third type of thing because this is the two one block what is a two one block so basically between every rr complex if you see two p waves this is r wave this is r wave this is r wave between everyone if you see just two p waves and uh, those P waves uh, are actually not uh, having that, uh, what you would say, complete dissociation with the QRS complex. For example, this one is associated with that QRS complex, this one is associated, this one is associated, but in, between these two, there is no beat after that. So there is a drop QRS complex. So this is a type of second degree block. That is not, that is not, uh, you can never classify it as a banky back or a mobile type two. Reason being, you cannot assess for the prolongation. For example, if I have a PR interval here and if the next beat is dropped, I can never assess whether it was prolonged or not. So you cannot tell whether it's swanky back or it's more set. Now, the management differs for each of them. So if you have uh, facing a two is to one block, what to do then? It's something beyond the scope of your assembly, something that I will not test you about. But if you want to know that what you can do uh, on this is that you do maneuvers. You do vagal maneuvers, you do pharmacological maneuvers. In a vagal maneuver, what will happen is that if you give adenosine or if you give carotid massage, the sinus rate will drop. When the sinus rate, rate drops, the AV node gets time to uh, come out of that refractoriness and this block would reduce in severity if it, is, if it was a mobile side one because that involves the AV node. So what would happen if instead of a two is to one, they would come convert into three is to two. For example, uh, two waves, like two RS complex, then the third one dropping. So if the block reduces after a vagal maneuver, it becomes a type one mobits. But if it is not reducing, it becomes a type two mobits. So that's how you treat it then. So a two is to one block needs to be differentiated on these things. But on, on the ECG alone, uh, without any maneuver, you cannot differentiate between a mobits type one and type two. Uh, and this presents with regular RR intervals. So be careful of the regular RR intervals. Irregular RR intervals are generally on the other hand easier because they're always second degree. They're never ever the first and third degree, right? So this is the next one. Uh, can you tell me what type of block this is? Any ideas what kind of block this is? Okay, so mobile side one, yes, you have a very clear PR prolongation, prolongation and then the beat is dropping. This classic mobile type one. The next one is obviously the last one left, the classic mobile type two. You have a drop beat, the PR interval is still prolonged and fixed. Uh, if you look at the PR interval, it is just slightly prolonged, just above 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.2 seconds. So, uh, any questions I would uh, be taking now and uh, I'd be ending the recording first. So, I'm welcoming any questions.